Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Electronic Correlations in Quantum Materials. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have a question, please submit it through the questions pane on your console. Any issues regarding connectivity and webinar viewing will be addressed immediately. We will attempt to answer any questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. If we do not get to your question, we will follow up via email after the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce the speaker for today's webinar. Sandia Susarla is an assistant professor at Arizona State University. She completed her postdoc at the National Center for Electron Microscopy at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, working with Dr. Peter Ursius and Dr. Ramamurthy Ramesh. She obtained her PhD in 2019 from the Material Science and Nanoengineering Department at Rice University, working with Professor Bulakel Ajayan. She also worked briefly in the Ursay STEM group under Professor Odile Stefan as a Chateaubriand Fellow. Her primary research interests lie in using analytical electron microscopy and spectroscopy tools to understand electronic correlations in quantum materials. In addition to electron microscopy, Sandia also has extensive prior experience in the growth of 2D materials. She has received recognition as an outstanding postdoctoral scholar from the American Physical Society and the Microscopy and Microanalysis Society. Now over to Sandia. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, today I'll be talking about how uh, K3 could be useful in understanding some of the subtle effects um, in quantum materials. So before I actually begin, I was uh, a postdoc at LBNL. So I most of my talk is actually related to what I did at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, I will be following uh, the uh, this sequence in the outline um, as stated in the outline of the talk uh, first we'll go over some of the challenges uh, that we have in uh, in terms of uh, understanding electronic correlations in quantum materials then i'll introduce uh, what i did uh, with k3 i basically uh, did electron energy loss spectroscopy and uh, I'll then uh, highlight why K3 is important to understand some of these important electronic effects. Um, and I'll end my talk with uh, some of the future prospects uh, in quantum materials. So um, all of this work was actually done at the Molecular Foundry. Uh, the picture that you see in this photograph is actually the Molecular Foundry building. Um, if anybody wants to work there, uh, it's free to use so you can access all the facilities uh, by writing a proposal and the proposal calls are uh, every march and september so um, uh, you're welcome to use it um, it has uh, so this work was actually done with a bunch of collaborators both from um, lawrence berkeley national lab as well as other places as well you see a host of universities and it was a, a very large effort to make all of these experiments possible um, but a major role was actually played uh, by uh, team one microscope that's at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to give you a context of what that microscope is it has a monochromator with a uh, 60 picometer spatial resolution it's probe corrected it's also image corrected as well um, the cool part about this microscope is that it was recently installed with the Getan K3 uh, detector and it, it uh, it was installed in a very unique way in the sense that most of the detectors are just uh, directly below the HADAP detector. Uh, but here, the K3 detector was actually in the back end of the spectrometer, so we got the advantage of using K3 for our EELS experiments as well. Um, and you can see the modulus transfer function for K3. It's absolutely fabulous, uh, which means that um, it actually counts every electron and uh, 
for especially for uh, sensitive materials where the electronic effects are subtle uh, k3 can be very very useful and in my talk I, actually i'll be giving you a few examples of where k3 was useful um, in addition to that um, you also have other things in this microscope like for example lorentz tem uh, and off axis holography because um, it's also chromatic aberration corrected as well and it's one of the uh, only microscopes in the world that, uh, at least for now, that's uh, uh, corrected for chromatic aberration. Uh, okay, so um, I will be talking about quantum materials today for most part of my talk. And to give you a context of what quantum materials are, these are material systems where your four degrees of freedom, spin, charge, orbital, and lattice are interconnected with one another. And the, the relationship between each of these degrees of freedom gives rise to different sort of effects at the mesoscale. For example, spin orbit coupling can result in the spin to charge conversion device that are used for data storage applications these days. Um, your electron phonon coupling is important for uh, thermoelectric materials. Uh, for your Rion Teller distortion is actually important for polarization, controlling polarization in the material or even magnetism in the material and so goes for exchange interaction as well. That tells me that uh, in order to understand all of these correlated materials, what you need to do is identify all of these degrees of freedom independently and actually separate from one another. And um, though the problem statement seems very, uh, very, very simple, but the solution is very complicated because um, in real life, all of these degrees of freedom are intermixed with one another. And when you are doing experiments, you need different um, sensitive experiments to separate out these things. So in electron microscopy, what we really care about is how do the local um, electronic and magnetic correlations affect these mesoscale effects like for example superconductivity or uh, you, you have these uh, different kinds of um, uh, spin to charge conversion efficiencies or uh, you have um, these various topological structures how do the local magnetic and electronic effects actually contribute to that uh, uh, mesoscale um, uh, structural uh, uh, me mesoscale effect the second thing is uh, what to what extent can electron microscopy actually help in answering these questions because after all electron microscopy can measure only a finite number of things and i'll be commenting upon that in uh, today's talk and act, uh, and how this bubble of limited uh, 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 information about electronic correlations was expanded with uh, the addition of the K3 detector in GitHub. So the major, so before before actually the K3 was installed, we had these following hurdles in quantum materials. For example, most of these materials uh, can be beam sensitive in in the sense that they can sort of uh, have uh, defects formed when you hit the electron beam. Uh, they always so the 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 important thing to remember is all of these degrees of freedom that are interconnected with one another have very, very subtle effects. So in order to capture that, you need uh, an, uh, an instrument that detects very, very subtle signals in that way K3 was beneficial as well. Uh, I also will be touching upon how we actually interpret EELS data sets because that also is complicated um, in these kind of correlated systems because you have these all degrees of freedom interconnected with one another and I'll also be talking about how you can measure emergent uh, phases in materials. So let's look at one of uh, the usual analytical electron microscopy tools that we use that are based on elastic scattering. One of the popular tools is, of course, high angle annular dark field uh, imaging, which is based on uh, the atomic number. Uh, this image is directly interpretable if it's a 2D material. For example, this was a case where uh, it was a mono layer of um, two dimensional chalcogenide, and uh, you could quantify the intensities to look at the different metal and chalcogen distribution at the atomic scale. Uh, but uh, for three-dimensional materials, uh, these uh, 
are mere projections. So in that sense, you need additional techniques to understand the three-dimensional picture of what is happening to the structural aspect of things. So in that sense, Podi STEM is actually a very useful technique to quantify what you see in uh, your STEM images. For example, here, um, I mean, this. I'll not be talking about this in uh, today's talk, but this was a very um, unique case where we actually measured the strain in these uh, uh, topological structures and oxides in order to unravel the chiral domain boundaries uh, in the material. Um, uh, it's similarly there is, uh, I mean, you can tune your convergence angle uh, to make your probe very, very small. And if you make your probe very, very small, then uh, it's sensitive to the local nuclear potential as well. And you can do phase contrast imaging and also measure the local nuclear uh, field in the material. And this is an example for that. Um, but all of this is actually related to elastic scattering, right? But you also have inelastic scattering effects that can give you completely different information. So all of, most of the elastic scattering is concerned with the nuclear contrast. Um, and so it's it's mostly sensitive to the structural um, uh, uh, properties of materials. But uh, the electronic properties are mostly controlled by what happens in the valence band or uh, how uh, you have these various bosonic excitations as uh, um, uh, at, um, so to say, nanoscale. Right? So there are two ways to measure the inelastic scattering in electron microscopy. One is EDS, where uh, actually you can detect chemical composition very, very um, well these days because of the, um, uh, uh, the new detector designs. Uh, I'll not be touching upon EDS today. What I'll be talking about mostly is in eels, uh, because that was the unique aspect that we had at LBL. Um, so in eels, uh, the unique part is that you measure the absorption. So you measure the electron uh, that are um, uh, inelastically scattered, and you measure them directly through the spectrometer that's coming in. and uh, depending upon where they are in an inelastically scattered the energy of the inelastic scattering you get different sorts of information for example in the near edge fine structure you get information about uh, the uh, chemical uh, heterogeneity in the material this is a beautiful example where we had um, uh, this magnetic material of iron germanium um, tellurium, where if you notice germanium and iron are very close to each other in terms of the atomic number, so you can't distinguish them through HADAF, but uh, with the help of um, this chemical mapping, you can actually distinguish where your germanium is and where your iron is. Um, at the same time, also, I'll be touching about how you can move beyond this chemical mapping and actually try to understand various subtle effects because of the uh, uh, because of these direct electron detectors. Uh, I, towards the end of my talk, I'll be moving towards low loss eels. Well, I'll be talking about uh, these bosonic states called excitons and uh, we could I mean, this is a very recent work of ours where we could uh, actually see where the excitons are located uh, in a moiety pattern of 2D materials. Um, so in terms of quantum materials, uh, there are very different types of quantum materials. I'll be talking about two kinds today. Uh, one is a thin film heterostructure where uh, you can grow these materials atom by atom. This was uh, These materials were grown when uh, I, in my postdoctoral lab, uh, and they were grown using pulse laser deposition. And uh, the precision for this technique um, is up to the atomic scale. That means that you can even control a unit cell uh, with uh, pulse laser deposition. On the other hand, Van der Waals heterostructures are materials that are naturally layered. So or what you do is you uh, use mechanical force. Uh, we call that mechanical exfoliation to separate out each of these layers. And then you can use your creativity to design your own heterostructure with various material combinations and they result in different sorts of properties and these days you also have a twist degree of freedom the famous example is superconductivity in graphene where your one degree twist resulted in superconductivity 
Okay, so let's look at some of the uh, core laws applications of K3 um, and uh, understand how uh, K3 was actually useful in trying to unravel different electronic states and quantum materials. So to begin with, what is core loss yield? So if you look at the equation for the core loss yields, it's very, very similar to X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And what it measures is the empty density of states. What it means is that whenever you have an electron in your core level, it gets excited uh, above the Fermi level and the energy lost by the electron in this excitation uh, is measured uh, by the energy loss uh, spectrum. And you can do various types of things with this uh, um, electron energy loss spectroscopy. You can uh, measure elemental maps, you can measure oxidation state, you can measure local bonding, orbital hybridization, crystal field mapping. Mind you, uh, all, most of these applications were restricted to elemental maps before the direct electron detectors. That's because uh, almost all the effects, apart from maybe the oxidation state, is are very, very sensitive uh, to the amount of noise that you have in your spectrometer. So if you don't do any processing, it's actually very, very tough to determine uh, what changes you have in yields. So that way K3 was a very, very important development that happened and uh, it actually opened up the space even in core loss fields. So this was uh, what was done previously with the TRIDEM detectors, which were the previous generation of the K3 detectors. And you could see two examples where you could map out uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, elements in the material and this is perovskite oxides, uh, of course. But what you notice is, uh, if, if you notice the acquisition time um, for both of these things, you will notice that it's very, very large. And, and these large acquisition times often result in different kind of artifacts. For example, you can have oxygen uh, um, uh, uh, defects in the material because of the high dose of the electron beam. At the same time, you can also have sort of drifts in the material. Um, so what the challenge was to improve the acquisition time as well as lower down the probe current in order to make sure that this chemical mapping can be possible with very, very uh, less time. And uh, actually, uh, when K3 was installed, I was lucky enough to be a postdoc uh, exactly at that time at LBL. And oh, oh, we have this very nice example of a strong shim titanate, lead titanate super lattice. And if you notice that in lead titanate, you have a single layer of strong shim titanate. And it's amazing that with the help of elemental mapping using the K3, and this was one of the first data sets that were collected in K3, um, you can actually see even the single unit cell in strong shim titanate. Um, and uh, what you would be amazed is that uh, and I've just shown a part of the data set. It's a huge data set. And um, you'd be amazed that this huge, um, I think it was about like the area was about 100 um, by 100 nanometers of area. And you'd be amazed that all of this was actually collected in three minutes. So that, that just tells you the power of K3 detector uh, in terms of just the basic elemental mapping. And it tells you that you need very, very small um, dwell time to capture these things. So you damage your material less. Um, let me, so, so a direct application of this is uh, um, uh, shown here, uh, wherein, I mean, um, of course, you've seen examples of direct chemical mapping, but this is a very unique case. I'll tell you why. Uh, so we had this very typical case of iron, cobalt, germanium, telluride, wherein you have two compositions of these materials. And you, if you notice, if you change your composition from 45% to 50%, actually the magnetic properties change dramatically from antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic. And what we were wondering was, what is the reason uh, for this to happen? And if you notice that, uh, uh, and, and the challenge was solved by actually um, 
a differential chemical mapping. And if, if you notice uh, in, in the differential chemical maps, wherein the more green it is, the more cobalt it has, the more red it is, the more iron it has. And if you notice uh, in these two materials, you have cobalt more close to the telur, uh, more close to the germanium in the AA type of configuration, and you have um, the cobalt more close to the telluriums uh, in case of the ferromagnetic uh, uh, composition. And that actually tells you the difference between um, these materials and why the magnetic properties are so different in both of these materials. And uh, I mean, we couldn't have done this uh, if we had so much of noise uh, in our spectrum images because um, uh, cobalt and iron are of course very, very close to one another. So backgrounds, there are several challenges to it. Like for example, background subtraction, um, you need to make sure that you have less noise in your spectra. And we were lucky that because of the K3, we could easily separate out uh, uh, the uh, noise and uh, we could uh, see um, the cobalt and iron spectra very, very clearly. Another example of uh, uh, this, how, how K3 helped us in understanding electronic states is uh, this um, very typical case of spin to charge conversion device. So spin to charge conversion device works in the sense that if you interface a ferromagnetic uh, magnetic material uh, with a, a heavy metal, uh, what you can uh, do is try uh, to um, exchange spins uh, from the ferromagnet um, and convert it into charge. And uh, the spin to charge conversion efficiency actually controls how much, uh, how fast you can charge your devices or how fast you can store data. So it, it's very, very important in, in terms of the application side, but um, Everything, if you notice, everything is controlled by what happens at the interface, right? So with with epitaxy, we could control uh, the number of unit cells, and it turned out that when you have 10 unit cells, whereas when you have 30 unit cells, things change dramatically um, in terms of uh, the um, uh, um, uh, the electronic. Um, uh, states, for example, magnes, uh, manganese LH has an oxidation state change when you have 30 unit cells versus 10 unit cells, and then you have a change in the hybridization in the oxygen KH because you see uh, subtle changes uh, in the oxygen KH as uh, you increase it from 10 unit cells uh, to uh, 30 unit cells, and it happens both for on the LSMO side and the strong shimmeridate side. And um, all of these were, uh, so I would, I would like to emphasize that all of these chemical maps were actually collected with a very, very small dwell time, which tells me that um, the, we don't uh, give enough uh, time for them to be damaged by the electron beam. With, if you increase your uh, dwell time by a lot, you don't know what's happening in the material because um, you can introduce different kinds of oxides, I mean, um, uh, uh, different kinds of oxygen vacancies. You can also change the oxidation state of transition metal dichalcogenizers, uh, transition metals as well. Um, the third example is um, going beyond uh, like the oxidation change, uh, state change and orbital hybridization and uh, trying to understand uh, uh, what is the crystal feel in the material. For example, this was a, a topological oxide, um, uh, 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 topological um, oxide vortex uh, structure, wherein you have these polarization that is rotating in a fashion that it forms a vortex out of it, just like how you form skirmions in magnetic materials. And uh, if you if you try to draw a cartoonish version of what hap what is happening at the atomic scale, as and when the polarization is changing, your hybridization between the titanium 3D orbital and the oxygen 2P orbital is also changing at the same time and uh, you have three kinds of effects that's happening you have to, uh, a polarization rotation you also have the polarization magnitude change as you go inside and you have strain in the material right so uh, 
the question was how do these three factors uh, come at play when you are trying to measure the yield spectrum of this material so when we when we measured the yield spectrum of this material uh, we operated under the monochromated mode uh, to get the maximum amount of um, uh, resolution in your titanium LED spectra and uh, uh, you have different components in the LED spectra you have the L3 edge and the L2 edge and within the L3 edge you have different uh, levels indicating the d orbitals uh, t2g means that um, you have uh, the uh, d um, uh, um, uh, uh, t2g means you have the lower end of the orbitals and eg means you have the higher end of the orbitals and uh, the uh, difference between these uh, two levels the t2g and the eg level is the crystal field splitting in the material and if you notice uh, you have these subtle changes between strong shim titanate and lead titanate as you move from the vortex core to the vortex edge and if you notice um, you have this extra component as well in your titanium led spectra now if you if you if you go back to the uh, crystal field uh, splitting theory, uh, uh, what we learned was that if you have a perfect octahedra, you have two kinds of level, the lower level being EG and the higher, uh, the lower level being T2G and the higher level being EG. And when you have an octahedral elongation, you have a change in the overlap of the titanium 3D orbitals and oxygen 2P orbitals. So you have a splitting in the EG level and the T2G level. Likewise, if you have a titanium titanium displacement uh, along with the octahedral elongation you have a change in these t2g and eg levels as well uh, so all of this information can actually be captured if you uh, try to collect data sets with high enough signal to noise with the help of direct electron detectors um, uh, uh, using this near-edge fine structure of titanium LH. Uh, but to prove this, we actually uh, uh, took the help of multiplet calculations where we um, correlated the DFT, uh, T2G, and EG splitting values with the actual yield spectra. And if you notice, when you input um, T2G splitting, EG splitting, and the crystal field splitting uh, in the multiplet uh, uh, calculations, crystal field multiplet calculations, which is a way to calculate core loss seal spectra, especially for transition metal L edges. It works beautifully uh, for transition metal L edges. Um, you would notice there's a beautiful correlation between theory and experiments. And you don't see that very, very often. Um, and, and the reason we saw that um, is because of uh, the uh, high signal to noise ratio experiments that we did with the K3 detector. Um, okay, so you saw uh, three kinds of examples in core law seals. We started with a very elemental example of um, elemental mapping. We saw how K3 accelerated the process by decreasing the dwell time. Um, we could map out uh, the different positions. Or, uh, atom we could do atomic scale yields mapping with a very, very small dwell time now with K3. Then we went to the differential chemical mapping where we could actually see um, the uh, the cobalt or the ion being co concentrated at different points that actually dramatically changed the magnetic properties of materials. Then we went to a spin to charge conversion device and we saw how at the interface uh, you have these different uh, electronic states that are forming. And then finally, we actually uh, take, took a look at a very complicated crystal field splitting that's going on at the atomic scale. And because we had such a nice uh, spectrometer and the monochromator, we could uh, resolve what was going on um, at uh, that length scale. Now, uh, uh, let me actually uh, uh, talk about the other aspect of fields, which is low loss yields. And uh, what I'll be actually sticking to today is mostly in the visible spectrum, um, uh, because the monochromator resolution that we had in team one is limited to like 0.15 EV. Uh, so what we could truly measure is in the visible range, which is between one to two EV. And in that range, um, low loss yields is actually 
uh, are very, very sensitive to the dielectric response function of the material. And uh, at the same time, we have to understand that at low law seals, you have this natural electron delocalization. And this graph from Edgerton shows this picture in a very, very beautiful way. Uh, in core law seals, theoretically, it's possible to get atomic resolution. When in, but in low law seals, it's very, very tough to get atomic resolution because of the way the electrons are delocalized. Uh, right. So, um, uh, so whatever we measure in the low law seals is mostly in the nanometer scale regime. And if you think about this low law seals, what we actually measure, and if you think about the dielectric uh, function of a material, it has two components to it. You have the polarizability component and you have the absorption component. And if you think about the electron uh, elastic, inelastic scattering, you have three components to it. You have uh, a component related to the sample. You have a component related to the energy loss function and you have a component related to your convergence angle or the collection angle. Now if you think about it, the first and the third component which is related to, uh, which is related to the sample thickness and the collection angle are either um, they can be controlled basically because you know you can control the collection angle uh, and you can control the sample thickness as well uh, but the second comp uh, component which is the energy loss function is actually related to the material property and it could change um, uh, and it that second component actually gives you the information about what is going on in the low loss uh, eels regime so it measures the imaginary part of the dielectric constant which is very very similar to what you see in the optical reflectance uh, spectrum or optical absorption spectrum right so uh, 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 i'll be talking about a very specific case study that we did with this low loss seals uh, which is um, uh, measuring excitons uh, in two dimensional materials an exciton uh, is a uh, a bound electron hole pair. Um, it is attracted by Coulombic forces of interaction, and uh, uh, you can have various uh, radii of um, exciton. That means that it can be de delocalized uh, in space in a normal material. Um, and in two dimensional materials, uh, you have um, two kinds of excitons. You have the intralayer exciton and you have the interlayer exciton. And in a very uh, trivial sense, you can imagine exciton to be little dipoles, where in your, in, in, in your intralayer exciton, you see that all of these are actually oriented in um, in plane direction, whereas in the interlayer exciton you have it out of plane. So why am I talking about all of these excitons? That's because very recently um, it uh, there was a speculation that these excitons could actually be confined uh, with external factors and external factors being uh, moiré pattern, right? Uh, so uh, a moiré pattern is basically generated when you have two uh, materials with totally different uh, with a certain degree of twist or two materials with different lattice parameters overlapped with one another right so moiré moiré pattern can exist in any uh, material in this context i'm talking about two dimensional material uh, and very specifically um, a tungsten sulfide tungsten selenide heterostructure right which has a, a natural moiré pattern because of the lattice parameter difference between tungsten sulfide and tungsten selenide so if you uh, look at it they have a four percent difference in the uh, lattice uh, parameter and that results in approximately seven to eight nanometers of uh, moiré pattern uh, uh, periodicity now it, it, why why is it important in terms of excitons now if you look at the optical absorption spectrum which tells you uh, uh, about uh, the excitons and it's very very similar to eels uh, you would see at that at large twist angles you have uh, the excitons in the wsc2 and ws2 with a very very sharp peak um, and these are intralayer excitons, which means that the excitons are confined within one plane. And now if I twist it to almost zero degrees, you would see all of these new states that are forming uh, at 
uh, uh, both tungsten sulfide uh, and tungsten selenide region and all of these new peaks are actually related to what uh, happens to uh, uh, the flat bands and what happens to the structure when you have this kind of a moire pattern uh, which is very very large periodicity now the question is uh, and and all of these effects actually happen at low temperatures so all of the experiments are done at 4 kelvin temperatures uh, and the question for, for uh, electron microscopy was, hey, can you actually tell us what's going on at the atomic scale, both in terms of structure and what happens to the electronic states and why are these excitons behaving in this fashion um, um, at uh, the atomic scale? Um, so uh, it's, it's though the pro again, though the problem uh, is very, very, problem statement is very, very simple. The solution is actually very difficult because, uh, I mean, I'll tell you why, because this is um, a typical um, yield spectra, right? If you notice it, um, you can't see anything apart from the zero loss peak, right? That's because your oscillator strength for the exciton, oscillator strength actually tells you how strong the peak would be in the yield spectrum. And the oscillator strength for the excitons in yields is actually very, very low. That means that you need a kick-ass detector to actually detect these subtle signals uh, in the first place. Uh, so you need a detector. You also need a monochromator. That's because these are at very, very low energies and uh, you don't want your zero loss peak tail to affect uh, these uh, uh, low energy peaks. So you need a monochromator as well. And because all of these effects are happening at low temperatures, you also need a low temperature holder. So we we started with the idea that, okay, if we have a low temperature holder and the monochromator, maybe we can do this. And we actually did this experiment and were unsuccessful. That's because you also need two additional components to it, which is the direct electron detector and the sample quality. Uh, 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 in the first uh, slide, I told you that these materials are actually very, very beam sensitive. That means that whenever you shine your electron beam, you have all sorts of um, uh, radiation damage happening which results in defects and chain completely changing the electronic structure so in order to prevent that you need to have a sacrificial layer uh, which acts as a barrier between the electron beam and actually the material that you're measuring uh, so in this case that was hpn so we ca encapsulated the material with HPN in order to make sure that you have a uniform dielectric uh, environment in the first place and second it prevents the material from damaging under the electron beam. So we had this material encapsulated between two HPN layers and uh, we actually, uh, so this was uh, non-trivial in a lot of sense. In terms of data processing also, this was very, very non-trivial because uh, of the low signal to noise ratio, our routine background subtraction routines uh, actually did not work. For example, the power law background subtraction, we did see some, some features, but it was not enough to comment upon uh, what is going on um, at uh, the uh, in in the spatial resolution sense. Um, we also uh, uh, tried this very popular technique used in the phonon yields literature where you subtract it with a reference and the reference was uh, bilayer HP and where you don't have this um, uh, tungsten sulfide tungsten selenide heterostructure and when you do that as well you do see something but it's definitely not enough to come in definitely uh, definitively on where the peaks are. But uh, when you do this pre-postage background subtraction, and by pre and postage means that um, you select uh, the area um, uh, where you just begin to see the peaks and you select the post edge area that's very, very uh, close to where your HBN plasmon begins. You actually try to see uh, these subtle features. And we play, uh, so uh, we were very certain about the post edge, but for the pre edge, we had to do a lot of averaging in order to define what pre edge we use. But all of this is, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, customizable depending upon how well your monochromator is aligned. In our case, we had the resolution of about 120 mEV, which is, of course, not enough to resolve all of these peaks. Um, okay, so once we were 
uh, uh, we were uh, confident of our background's attraction routines. We we tried to compare our spectra with the optical uh, uh, optical reflectivity measurements, and what you see is a nice correlation between. Uh, the uh, things that you see in optical reflectivity measurements and uh, the things that you see um, in low law seals, including the subtle um, uh, uh, negative shift that you have as compared to the A exciton WSC2 in the WS2 WSC2 heterostructure, right? Now, if I zoom in this uh, WS2 WSC2 heterostructure, what you will notice is that because the optical reflectivity measurements were done at bokeh, Kelvin with the 5 mEV resolution, you can see all of these three peaks. But as and when you, inc uh, um, uh, you increase the full width half max, it also becomes very, very similar to what you see in the yield spectra. So uh, it so you can sort of correlate the optical reflectivity spectra with your low loss yields. So um, now the problem was that, okay, we have got the spectra, this is the average spectra with the K3 detector, but still it was very, very difficult um, uh, detecting what's happening at the atomic scale because at the end of the day, we acquired these scans very, very fast because we did not want to damage the material. So how do you solve the problem of uh, creating these yields maps. So what we tried to do was unit cell averaging, and this is credit to uh, Peter Ercius at uh, Berkeley, where he developed algorithms for that, um, wherein you take a, a low magnification image. Um, uh, this is a, a, um, ban a low bandpass filtered uh, image, and uh, you can uh, sort of locate all the AA sites. By AA sites, I mean whenever your tungsten is in on top of tungsten or uh, sulfur is on top of uh, selenium. That means chalcogen is on top of chalcogen or um, your metal is on top of metal that, that are known as AA sites. So we, we try to uh, determine all the AA sites and we had to define a special lattice for that uh, uh, because um, actually uh, we, we just found uh, all the, um, so, so the way we uh, defined a special lattice site was that we just found all of the uh, spots that we detected in this low mag image and then we define uh, tried to define a specific lattice where the water uh, the the edges were all the aa sites that's how we distinguished the aa sites from the other sites in in the material now uh, what we did was we created a moiety unit cell wherein uh, we uh, we tried to identify the AA spots with the newly defined lattice and uh, you uh, sort of interpolate in between all of those AA spots and create this uh, interpolated moiré unit cell and then you sum it up um, by going over the entire lattice and this is a 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer region approximately and what you see is a um, uh, is this image uh, which is the simultaneously unit cell averaged um, adf image and what you notice is that you have these triangular regions in the ab sites whereas in the aa sites um, you have uh, this um, very small circular region and this is the structural reconstruction that happens when you form this uh, moiré pattern at a very, very small angle. Um, so if you notice, uh, the AA sites have tungsten on top of tungsten um, and chalcogen on top of chalcogen. So if you think intuitively, uh, uh, what you would see is uh, that um, this AA site may not be very, very stable because of the steric hindrance that's happening with the metal on top of metal and chalcogen on top of chalcogen. So it actually undergoes a structural reconstruction, especially at low moiré uh, um, uh, twist angles and large moiré periodicities to form this uh, reconstructed lattice. And this reconstructed lattice could have uh, important manifestations in terms of where the excitons are located, right? Um, so now we could easily translate it uh, into our low loss seal spectra because all we had to do was uh, take the same 2D data set for a yield spin image um, and uh, uh, try to 
uh, see um, if we can see the same unit cell averaged image uh, as the eel spectra turns out that uh, our resolution at the single pixel level was not enough to resolve it so what we tried to do was uh, um, uh, uh, something known as masking where we created a mask of uh, this um, uh, um, probably like five pixels by five pixels mask and uh, tried to go around that mask and uh, uh, averaged out the yield spectra. And if you look at uh, this, this is how our single uh, average mask for AA spectra looks like. And um, you could do that uh, for all the AA sites. So what we did was we, we went with this mask at all the AA sites. We went with this mask at all the AB sites. And we went with this mask at all the other AB sites and summed up the yield spectra just to look at the yield spectra first before believing the maps. And if you look at the yield spectra, uh, when you average out the mask um, uh, region, you could see a beautiful correlation between the experiment and the theoretical yield spectra. And uh, what you could also uh, do is repeat this in two dimensions, and then we create this beautiful exciton map. Um, so what we actually measure, we measure the exciton density of states in a two-dimensional space. And what we notice is that the exciton density of states are actually confined to the AA points, which have uh, the minimum area. And uh, the reason why it's confined to AA points is because um, it has the uh, flat bands there, and that's how uh, uh, the transition uh, uh, happens, a very specific to the AA points. And theoretically, it is also known that the electrons and holes, uh, so exciton is actually composed of electrons and holes. So at the AA spot, the electrons and holes are located at the same point, And that's why you see uh, these excitons at the AA points. Um, so to actually, okay, I'm right on time. So, okay, so to ask, uh, so to conclude what I uh, I showed you, and bef uh, I mean, I just have two more slides on the future. Uh, so to conclude, what I uh, uh, wanted to point you out was that K3 has actually opened up a lot of space to do different kinds of experiments, especially for quantum materials, um, uh, starting from differential chemical NABs to finally ending at excitonic imaging. And uh, that was all not possible Possible because of uh, the simple fact that you did not have enough signal to noise uh, to even comment on what's going on in your yield spectra. And that's why the earlier studies were mostly restricted, uh, at least with the 2D maps, they were mostly restricted to detecting the position of atoms in an image. Um, uh, or chemical imaging. But uh, now with this direct electron detectors, it completely opens up the space to do, go beyond that and try to uh, understand different subtle electronic effects. Um, so what's the future? Uh, so I think uh, the future is a, there are different directions for the future for these uh, direct electron detectors. First is uh, now that we have the high signal to noise ratio, we can, and this is like five years beyond, we can start imagining that you have this core law seal spectra and uh, you have this core law seal spectra with a high signal to noise ratio. So now you have the opportunity to compare it with the a, a theoretically calculated spectra and there are actually efforts going on on the on the theoretical side to create a database for eels as well as xas and now if you can integrate this this theoretical database with the experimental one because now now the uh, experimental signal to noise ratio is sort of reaching what is possible theoretically then you can actually uh, do real time core loss analysis um, the second uh, aspect is the power of multimodal techniques. As I said in the start, uh, especially for quantum materials, one technique is not enough because you need to untangle different degrees of freedom. And in order to do that, you need a combination of different techniques. And uh, 
uh so 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 far we have been making tremendous progress in trying to uh, make one technique better with help of direct electron detectors for example you have the 4d stem component you have the eels component and the eds component all of the three have their own advancement with the direct electron detectors but uh, over the years we can imagine that all of these uh, things would be integrated into one where we do just one experiment and collect both ED, all eds yields and 4d stem together as a multimodal characterization hopefully it would be like a seven dimensional uh, data set and it would be a ter uh, it would take grad student years to analyze but of course we are doing well with our data processing so i think this is possible um, in a few years uh, time we also need faster detectors and why i say faster detectors is because uh I mean, at least what I dealt with is all in organic materials, right? Uh, so they are uh, the uh, the dose threshold for them is uh, relatively high as compared to the organic materials that change structure as soon as you hit the beam. So you need faster detectors in order to capture that. And I think uh, I don't know. Get, uh, I think Katan may be already progressing in this direction, actually. Um, so the last two aspects are actually very, very specific to quantum materials. That be that's because most of the effects that you see in quantum materials or the exciting properties that you see in quantum materials are often at low temperatures and that's the temperature range between 10 kelvin to 100 kelvin and unfortunately till now we haven't um, accessed that space so in the upcoming years I, I think we'll see a lot of progress in colder experiments and also colder experiments with electrical biasing uh, in order to um, sort of detect all of uh, these with much more precision. So I have a new home. Uh, I am at Arizona State now, and I just wanted to advertise Arizona State as well. So we do also have different uh, microscopes as uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And unlike Lawrence Berkeley, our microscopes are actually quite available. <laughs> Lawrence Berkeley Lab has a lot of user base. So uh, to get time on the microscope, you have to wait like a month uh, but uh, you don't have to do that at ASU you have different kinds of microscope we have the neon microscope which can detect phonons uh, in materials we also have the geol arm which can do atomic resolution imaging we ha have the titan with the k3 um, and uh, this titan is very unique in the sense that it has got gas injection system and the k3 is installed in the same way as uh, at berkeley lab wherein you have the k3 attached at the back end of the spectrometer um, with this i would like to advertise my group come and work with us and i'm happy to take any questions um, and over to jonathan i hope i was in time andrew yeah <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. That was great. Uh, there's a lot of very good examples of how we can apply the, uh, the K3 on the back of the continuum to, to measure some very, some very subtle features in the near-edge fine structure as well as the, um, the exton mapping. That was, those are really great examples. Um, so we had, we had a few questions come in. Um, so the first question that I that I kind of addressed a little bit in the chat was um, there was a question about some layered structures. Uh, specifically, there was a, a, li a looks like a lithium uh, nickelate with a with some dope with lanthanum. And the question was the first part of the question was um, how to identify the the lanthanum sites when it's doped with five percent lanthanum. So the the, the, the question is a little bit nuanced. So the the detection limit, the ultimate detection limit or sensitivity of eels is 0.1 atomic percent. Um, but that is the concentration of a particular element in the Z direction of the sample. So you might be able, so the, the local concentration may be large enough that you can detect lanthanum. Um, and in reality, when you're mapping 
um, at the atomic scale, you're you're probably really limited more to like one or two atomic percent just because of issues like drift or um, beam damage. You can only scan over an area long enough before, um, you know, especially the oxides will start becoming reduced. So um, it really depends on what the local concentration is of a particular element. Um, with that, uh, and I yeah. mean, to, to add on to that, I'll tell you one of our failed experiments as well. So when I was trying the K3 at LBL, we had an example where we had like 0.1% ion uh, doped lead titanate, and we were trying to detect ion in lead titanate, and we failed. So we couldn't see anything, basically. So you're right. I think we, we need a higher percentage of um, the dopants in order to see them through eels, actually. Yeah, and that, and that, that, that limit is not really going to be improved by the detector. It's, it's a really, it's a physical limit of the technique itself because eels has a, it's basically, you're looking at an ionization edge on a very large background. So that, that the background that we fit a power law to is, that's always increasing as you increase your integration time. So you, you can never outrun the, the intensity of the background. So as you integrate more, your background becomes higher in that. So that jump ratio will always kind of, you know, it'll max out eventually. Yeah. Um, let's see, the, there was another question. Okay, so the, next, the other question that was kind of harder to answer with just text was, what is the maximum probe current you can use before saturating K3 when you're acquiring ZLP or dual yields? My experience is that less than 90 picoamps um, using the smallest light kind of dual time, but sometimes to detect trace elements, I need to use 170 picoamps. Um, so you so you can modulate the live time. Uh, so the, the fast shutter um, allows you to um, expose the, the each frame readout of the set of the k3 sensor so that you're not going over the threshold of the, the detector itself um, in my experience uh, you know you can go up to 250 picoamps without saturating the zero loss speaker not really you're not really saturating the zero loss peak when you see color changes you're seeing that you're going over the counting threshold which means that the, there's more than one electron coming in per frame on the detector. Um, so in my experience, you can you can reduce the the lifetime or the speed of the shutter to be fast enough where you're you're not oversaturating the detector, um, and then you can increase your dwell time so that you so you're summing more frames to get a higher dynamic range on the zero loss peak. Um, but typically, yeah, that you I, I usually up, up, around 250 peak lamps. I don't see that it goes over the counting threshold. Um, and you can go over the counting threshold by a little bit. You're not going to oversaturate or damage the the sensor itself. You just won't have the sensitivity and the low loss to um, to 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 have the, you know the counting. Which is if you're going for a core loss, that's not necessarily something you would you you would necessarily be worried about because your your exposure time on the the, the the high loss is going to be different anyways um, and going to be read out separately. Um, let's see. Yeah, there was another question. And this might be a little bit more for you, Sandia. So the, so how do you, I don't, I'm not, I've never heard of this before. How do you correlate the DAR charge analysis data with this method of electron microscopy? Uh, what, what, how do you correlate? The DAR charge analysis? Have, is that something you've heard of? No, I haven't heard of that. What? What is? Can you type it in? I'm, maybe I'm not getting the pronunciation right. Badar charge analysis. Mm -hmm. Oh, I am not aware of that. I am sorry, I'm not aware of that, actually. I'll be curious to learn more about it. I'll actually Google it after this. So I don't know about that, sorry. What is the data? Um, and, and then let's see, what's the other? Uh, uh, 
So there is one question about, um, you know, are there optical experiments for correlating like a, a ellipsometry or, or um, near it, uh, NR spectroscopy? So um, there, with with the monochrome, or I don't, uh, uh, Sandhya, did you want to answer that? Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah. So, so depends upon the range you're looking at, I think. Uh, so if you are, so with your ellipsometry also, you can get the same information as low loss seal. So it's like a good um, kind of technique to uh, try to understand what's going on in low loss seals. Uh, ellipsometry, optical absorption, optical reflectivity would give you the same information. As long as in ellipsometry, you are able to separate out the imaginary part of the dielectric constant because that's what you see in low loss seals. Um, in terms of like these days, low loss seals is a very vague term. So I was very specific about the energy range, but if you go lower in your energy range, like below one EV, uh, then things do change a little bit and it's still not understood whether it's sensitive to neutron scattering, Raman or IR. So uh, there is still research going on in that direction. Uh, but at least in one above one EV, it's known uh, what works. So you can, um, at least there are enough experiments uh, done in that direction. So you can um, sort of use ellipsometry. Yeah, and then I think that the, there has been, I've seen a few papers where they've overlaid, you know, um, correlating NIR data with uh, like low loss spectra. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe you do that with the um, with the the exciton map, right? The in the in the publication that you have, there's a yeah, kind of a comparison. But it's, not, but it's not NIR; it's in the visible range, so it's mostly um, in in uh, using optical reflectivity. Um, I mean, you can yeah, NIR also for uh, there are papers with NIR as well. But if you go like very low, where you hit phonons, then uh, I mean, some people say that it's sensitive to IR. Some people say it's sensitive to Raman. Some people say it's sensitive to neutrons. So uh, there are all sorts of debates uh, in the community, and I think it it will take some time before everybody knows what's going on. Okay. And then I guess the last question we can take is, um, so the, there's one question about detecting magnetic excitations like magnons. Um, have you looked into that at all with the, with, with like the, um, the complex uh, oxide? Well, yeah, I think that is a great experiment. Although there are certain constraints that we have to take care of, for example, how do we take care of the magnetic field that is there um, in our microscope and uh, what range magnons are, right? Because I think that's sort of the major constraint these days, even with the gas neon spectrometer, you can get a two milliEV resolution, three milliEV resolution which is still like just touching the terahertz regime but magnons are mostly in gigahertz so then how do you uh, i think it, it will take some time or it, it might work in a very very specific case where the magnons are in gigahertz and you can probably see that um, uh, then also because it's a magnetic component uh, you can uh, be affected by what um, a magnetic field you have so maybe you have to keep your objective lens off um, to do the experiment so yeah i mean right. if, you, if you take care of all these things yeah magnons is theoretically possible with low loss seals all right well i think that's it for the questions that have come in um thank you very much uh sandia for the great talk and yes. uh, the wonderful data that you presented. Uh, this is really great work. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.